Committee on Real Estate will begin. Pursuant uh, to the meeting law, any person making an audio or video recording this public meeting uh, or may transmit this meeting through a media, attendees are therefore advised that such a recording or transmission are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and deemed acknowledgeable and permissible. Okay, roll call, please. Councilor Gallagher. Councilor Kilby? Here. Councilor Lee? Here. Chairman Pelletier? Here. First order of business is uh, the minutes of, oh, we, do, do we have a? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, we have a citizen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'll read it for you. Yes, sure, thank you. It's from the Preservation Society of Fall River. It says, dear members of the City Council Committee on Real Estate, the Preservation Society of Fall River is pleased the city has received a bid for the redevelopment of the former Central Police Station at 158 Bedford Street. However, as a purchase and sale agreement is already partially signed, our members would like more information on what conditions of sale are included in the draft agreement and what the vetting process for bidders is. We requested information on the vetting process from attorney Matt Thomas almost two months ago and have not received any details as to the requirements. In the past, city sales of historic buildings have included numerous conditions of sale to ensure the project is completed or the city is compensated. Unfortunately, a lack of oversight and follow-up has allowed for multiple properties to fall short of their promised redevelopment without consequence. Additionally, our board of directors was surprised to learn that the city had only briefly advertised the sale of 158 Bedford Street in the state's central register and not any other mediums typically used for development projects such as these. Members of the Preservation Society believe that it's essential to comprehensively market these historic resources to ensure an outcome in the best interest of Fall River and its residents. Sincerely, the Preservation Society of Fall River Board of Directors, Jim Sewell, President. Thank you. All right, uh, first order of business, uh, minutes of the meeting. Huh? You did it, though. Oh, you did? Yeah, were you sorry, sleeping? I was sleeping. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Number two on the agenda. Minutes of the meeting, February 18th. Motion to adopt the minutes. Motion to adopt. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, minutes of the meeting, March 3rd. Same motion. Motion, motion made. made. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, then we got uh, number four. Resol uh, I need a motion to take it off the table. Motion to take it off the table. Second. Second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so be it. Uh, discussion the former police station located at 158 Bedford Street to prepare a request for proposal and review the PNS agreement and such property to Wethersfield LLC. Table 3-3. Three, three. Uh, I'm going to ask Tammy, uh, you put this out and then you gave timeline on this. Could you just give us the timeline? Okay, it was advertised in the Central Register as well as in the Herald News. And let's see if she thinks. It was advertised in the Herald News. March 25th, I believe. I take that back. It March 3rd, was, was it? It was advertised in the Herald News on March 21st. I have okay. the advertisement here. And this must be the central <coughs> register date of March 25th. All right. And um, and then the bids were due in, the proposals were due on Friday, April 24th. That's it. How many, how many people picked up uh, papers to, to bid? One, two, three, four. How many returned? One. One, oh, this is all one. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, Pertaining to Sewell's letter, what's, uh, 
What's up with that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's nice to see you all again. Um, I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Sewell that it's important to try to vet people that are bidding on our projects and to try to advertise it. In the present situation, we acquired this property back um, on August 22nd of 2012. We then put it out for bid 2013, 2014, and 2015, and there were no bidders. So this is the fourth time this has gone out to bid. Um, fortunately, this time that it went out to bid, we did have somebody respond. Um, I actually responded. Um, I had been forwarded the email from Mr. Sewell, um, and I responded back on June 9th, 2020, to the um, Corporation Council and to, the, and to Mary that um, my understanding was that it had gone in the central register, which is where you publish projects like this. Everybody knows that if they're looking for a piece of municipal property or a project, that's where they go. It was in the Herald News, and that I would defer to Tammy on the further details, but that it was my understanding that there had only been one responsive bidder. Um, I also responded to, to Alan um, and Mary on June 11th um, with regard to the vetting process. And uh, Mr. Letterman's um, application, his, his um, proposal, had a lengthy list of other projects and references. I contacted most of them and followed up on additional information that the Preservation Society had supplied as well that they were concerned about. And I put that all into a report, a three-page report, and I submitted that to the Corporation Council on June 1st. So. I respectfully uh, disagree that I haven't responded. I responded back to the city, um, which is who I do work for. So, so uh, we saying that it was a responsibility of Corporation Council to forward the uh, the information to Mr. Sue. I'm not saying yes. I'm not saying no. Well, I mean, uh, I was responding to. He asked me a question, and I responded to him. So what he decided to do with it after that is within his discretion. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the Preservation Society is in a city board. Um, so that would be a discretionary thing. Um, in the vetting report, there were some things in there that may have been deemed confidential. And so he may have made that determination. Um, but I, I would defer to him on that. I'm not saying he should have sent it out. I'm not saying he shouldn't have. It was within his discretion what to do. He may have been satisfied with the answer I gave him. Well, you know, we've been having really problems uh, with Alan Renzi, and tonight is not different. He was invited. He was invited, and uh, he sent a little note here. Attorney Matt Tavis, uh, Thomas has been handling the sale. The former police station on behalf of the city, as such, Attorney Thomas will attend the real estate committee meeting on tonight. Well, uh, you know, he's a corporation counsel. The other guy who lined everything up, uh, uh, the, uh, the s &P, and it seems that you put a lot of work in this thing. Thanks. Uh, and what involvement did the corporation have to do with this? Well, Mr. Chairman, if I can just respond. Um, I did speak with Alan on Friday. Um, and he said to me, do you think I need to go? And I said, look, it's up to you if you want to go or not. I said, but the way this has worked, you've given it to me to do. I've done it. You've reviewed it. Um, Attorney Howieak reviewed it. Um, they had some comments that they, you know, some questions and comments that I incorporated into the final draft. And I said to him, if the roles were reversed, quite honestly, I would probably respond that I'd rather not go. I'd rather send you if you had written it because you, you, it's only fair to assume that you all have questions. And I was the one who wrote it, so I should have to be the one who defends it. So, uh, uh, you know, with regard to that, we did have that conversation. Um, he did review it, to my knowledge. Um, he said he forwarded it to Attorney Howieak to review as well. I had a couple of conversations with Attorney Howieak. I had conversations with him regarding the vetting. So, well, um, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I'm not saying he should have been here or he shouldn't have. It doesn't surprise me that he wasn't here because he and I had a conversation about that. Okay. Well, uh, still, I think, uh, uh, Councilor Kirby. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your comments, Attorney Thomas. Uh, but more important, more important for me 
is did the chairman, did you invite him? Absolutely. By the chair of the, the committee, notwithstanding the fact that, uh, you know, the chairman of the council's comments, he should be. That's all I can say. Okay, Councilor Tretley? We've uh, spoken multiple times about the, the corporation council you situation. It's on. It's on. Oh, it's on. We've, but uh, we've we've spoken multiple times about the corporation council situation, and I'm not I'm not going to add to that right now. I think we all know where we stand on that. Um, my question was was actually more about the vetting process. Um, is there a way for and, and is it in this packet? Because I did look through this packet. Is no, I um, the vetting process was. Um, if that's what you're asking yes, about. Yes, sir, okay. and, and I'd, I'd like to have, add a little bit more, but I want to hear you out. Uh, Not a problem. Um, <clears throat> it's a fair question because the reason we're even dealing with this at this point in time is because when the first sale happened, um, the person that they sold it to didn't do what they said they were going to do. So it's only fair to assume that the next time we finally get somebody that's interested in it, we should make sure that they're going to do what they're going to do. And when we do get into a discussion of the PNS, I think there's a few things I want to highlight that make sure that that happens yep. here. But with regard to vetting, um, we were given um, substantial uh, references. Um, for, and we asked for projects that were public projects, projects that were in different types of um, things that uh, Mr. Letterman and his firms had done. And uh, we did get back respond, you know, we did get back a nice list. And um, it was specifically in the RFP uh, section 10.2.5 was said, the development proposal must describe the bidder's prior experience with redevelopment of brownfields, including specific examples of successfully completed brownfield redevelopment uh, redevelopments completed by the bidder. Um, there were four projects submitted. One was with uh, Medford, the MWRA. One was with the City of Boston on a fire station. One was with Action mm -hmm. Environmental on, um, in Waltham. <coughs> It was on work in a site in Stoughton, and there was another one on work um, on a uh, realty property in Cambridge. Um, I was able to speak with uh, two of the people from those projects. We also had a lengthy list of references. Um, I spoke to four of the references, um, and uh, they were describing different projects about installing water and sewer projects. Spoke very highly of him. Uh, excavating water and sewer service installation. Um, the Another one was a water and service pro sewer project, uh, replacements of an underground piping system for the Methuen housing project. And then I had uh, two very lengthy conversations with Mr. Letterman himself. Yeah. And so based on all of that is what I wrote in the report. Do you, do you get a visual of any of the properties or any of did you have a chance to look? Did at I go them? visit any of them? Yeah. Did you get to no, see any of no, these? No, okay. No, just, no. just curious on that. And is that typical usually in the vetting process? The vetting process. What I'm more concerned about is talking to, in the 30 years that I've been doing this. Yeah. And, and I and I apologize. No, and I understand that. No, no. These are right. fair questions. Yeah. Uh, in the 30 years that I've been doing this, what I normally do is I rely when I'm vetting something like this, more on a conversation with the people running the project. Because to be very frank with you, in the end, you can have a wonderful looking building. Right. And if it was a nightmare to get there, you can't tell that from how the building looks. But if you talk to the people that have worked with them, and were they easy to work with? Were they flexible in, in dealing with problems that came up? Were they um, attentive? And those are the questions I got. And to be very frank with you, the answers I got back were resoundingly yes. So you feel 100% confident? So in, in my experience, those are the things you're looking at. Um, we had a letter from the bank that said that he um, had uh, had a, you know had talked to the bank about funding, and then the other thing that, for my my purposes, gives me a little bit greater confidence is this is a very substantial purchase and sale agreement with substantial deadlines in it, mm -hmm. and he was represented by a very good attorney, David O'Neill, and David and I discussed back and forth on these provisions four different times, and on all four occasions, they were pretty extensive conversations, and then he followed up back with me after having spoken to Mr. Letterman, because my concern was somebody going into this without eyes wide open, and really, you know, not knowing, having the wherewithal. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it appears that, and I can't guarantee anything, none of us can, 
but based on the conversations I've had with the, re the references, based on the conversations I've had with his attorney in response, and based on conversations I've had with Mr. Letterman himself, it appears that he is fully aware of what's going on, what he needs to do. He's fully aware of how it has to be done. He's actually done parts of these types of projects before. He's currently managing, you know, projects. And it's probably the most vetting that we have had on a project that we have sold, I'd say, in the last four to five years. So while no one can guarantee it, it's, it there is a vetting process that I will stand behind. And typ typically, do, do we ever, the, 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 co the uh, subcommittee, do we usually get a copy or any type of information of the vetting at all, or is it usually just the way it is presented today? This is, quite honestly, the only time that I've ever had to sum go through the vetting process on one of these. The other project, most tax possessions are sold through auction. Yeah. This one is not being sold because of the nature of it and because of what has to happen to it. The only other project that was like this was the Abbey Grill. Okay. And on the Abbey Grill project, when that one did come in, um, that was done pretty much the same way as this. And um, Mr. Lombardo, I think it was Lombardi or Lombard? Lombard. Yeah, who came in. Pretty much went through the same type of vetting process. I don't think anybody went to go look at the projects he had done, but he went through a similar type of vetting project process. I didn't submit a written report. He actually um, had spoken himself to some of the city councilors, um, and so I didn't have to do a report on it. But normally, what I would do is, if I was doing vetting, I would send it to the corporation council's office only because. We normally do the sales through the treasurer's office, and on those, as tax title attorney, I'm the legal advisor for that. This is actually going through the council with the mayor's signature. Whenever it's the council and the mayor's signature, that's the corporation council, and so I wanted you them involved. You follow the proper procedure that all you, the way that you through. saw, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> am I my last? Well, I'll probably have some more, but that's okay. I, I just wanted to um, also know, and, and again, we're kind of basing some of these some of these questions off of the. Uh, citizens input and, it, and and I respect um, the the preservation society and it's part of the reason why I have this in front of yeah. me just asking these questions um, <clears throat> they said typically uh, medium other mediums typically used for development projects it sounded like you went through all the mediums were there other mediums that that they could be referencing I'm, I'm not sure no. I, I, I okay. would tend to think that at the end of the day I don't think that the preservation society and I'm not trying to put words in their mouth sure but they have a goal. They have a, a, a mission. And their mission is to preserve buildings. It's no different than the mission of Whale in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. um, and having dealt with Whale in New Bedford when I was city solicitor there for, and development attorney for a number of years, they would like to see every building preserved um, and gone to an adaptive reuse. This building has gone out a number yeah. of times. Yeah. And the problem with it is that as every year goes by, the building starts to demolish itself a little bit right. further. Here, uh, the way the RFP went out, we wanted it to be preserved and restored, unless it couldn't, and you had to explain why. Mm -hmm. And he did. And um, I think he's come up with a very unique, well, very clever way of dealing with it. It's a way that's worked in Boston on a couple of cases. Um, right down in the financial center, they do what's known as a facadectomy. They demolish the building, but keep the facade and then they incorporate the facade into the building. Yeah. And it's done, if it's done correctly, it really looks nice. Um, right at the corner of State, right at State Street across from the old um, State House in Boston, right near Faneuil Hall, near the government center section, there's a building that's a, I think it's probably a 50-story, 40-story building that, has a, that had a facadectomy mm -hmm. on the first three floors. And it looks pretty good. Yeah. So it may not be a full preservation it may be the most that they can do out of it but the concern I think and I'm not trying to put words in the administration's mouth either but the concern they have is soon this will become a public safety risk right just like uh, and King at that Wilson point in time yeah. the choices are going to be really limited the choices are going to be do we pull it apart or do we knock it down you know and if this had just come in as a tax possession and we had gone just this one time through we might have tried maybe architectural digress, maybe historic preservation of, of those types of things. Um, you know, there's a, there, there's a historic preservation in Massachusetts, maybe. The thing is, this has gone through so many times where 
the building has been there. I, I've actually, I went to a Brownfields conference in St. Louis a few years back, St. Louis, St. Louis a few years back, and I took pictures of this building with me. Um, I was on a, a, a panel there, um, a Brownfield panel, and I took stuff with me to try to pitch it to people to see if they were interested. Okay, so I mean, people have had an opportunity to acquire this. The people who look at it, it's been in the newspaper, Lord knows, enough. Right. That at this point in time, with all due respect to them, and I have great respect for what they do, you come to a point where you have to fish a cut bait. And at this point in time, this I think this is the best proposal that's and, before and us. And I'm not in disagreement with what, what you're saying at all. And I, I think that we we've seen this property as a hot topic, you know, around the city for multiple years right. now. And I think we're, we're approaching an opportunity that we may see something good come out of this. And I think we've been burned so many times. <laughs> I don't think anyone can deny that we've been burned a lot of times when we try to do s these kind of things. So we have to be as diligent as possible. I, I think that it's our obligation. I agree with you, so. I yield. And that's Thank what you. I tried to do as well in, in drafting this and in negotiating this. Um, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, I'd just like, would like to highlight a few pieces of this. Excuse me. Thank you. So um, on page two of the, uh, I believe you have copies of it. So on page two, the purchase price is set in paragraph eight. It's at $10,000. Um, and uh, that was based on the fact that um, the building has substantial demolition work that has to happen and other things. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm on page two, paragraph eight. Uh, there'll be a payment in lieu of taxes required. Um, depending on when that sale happens during the course of the year, uh, the payment in lieu is based on the tax rate times the sale price. So it's not a hefty payment in lieu. It would be about $306.10. Depending on when it happens during the year, it's prorated for the number of days left in the year. Um, or if it happens um, after January, then it would be for the following year as well. Um, the, uh, Mr. Letterman uh, would have to pay the recording fees as well. Um, on the next page, we're currently holding a deposit of $8,200 on this. Um, and the time for performance is 10 days after the due diligence is finished or no later than December 31st, 2020. So that seems like a long time out. But one of the major things that has to happen, aside from the due diligence, is because this building is a brownfield and it does have contamination in it, um, in order for Mr. Letterman to buy it and not be in that chain of liability, he has to have what's known as an all-appropriate inquiry done by a licensed site professional, and they produce a prospective purchaser letter. And that prospective purchaser letter is given to us, and it's held by him at the time, and that keeps him out of the chain of liability. And as long as he doesn't do anything to make the property more contaminated, he's not in the chain of liability. Um, he's, he has to try to address it as best as he can, but he's not liable for it. If he does something that exacerbates the situation, then he would become liable. But that typically will take two to three months to do under the best of circumstances. Given the challenges under COVID-19, we decided that it made sense to make sure he had the time to do that so he wasn't coming back for extensions. And so it'll close on or before December 30th. Okay. Um, under uh, the bottom here, on, under uh, 11F, risk of loss. So as I mentioned, the intention is to do a facade ectomy, as they call it. Mm -hmm. um, the risk of loss is such that if, due to a storm, fire, or whatever, there is damage to the building, and that, build, da that damage is more than $10,000 worth of damage to the facade, it has to be to the facade. If that's the case, he has a chance to opt out. Okay? If he doesn't, if it's not more than $10,000 of damage to the facade, the project continues. And that's a normal provision that you would put in there. Um, normally it's to the whole building, but since he's going to demolish most of it, we limited it to the facade. And, um, and that's, can I just answer, or do they go, sure. want me to go through you? And that's just the if. It's, uh, has there been any sort of prior? So it would have to know. be a bolt of lightning striking it. Okay. The only thing that's happened to that facade is somebody drove into the front of it. Okay. Not too long ago, and took out one of the pillars, um, those pink granite pillars that are in the front. Um, the car ran right into it, took it out. 
um, we have pieces of it. And included in this purchase and sale is getting those pieces back to Mr. Letterman so that he can try to build it into the facade. Um, right now, they're being stored by Mr. Gallagher. And this was, was, was this a part of the um, process of determining the $10,000 purchase? Yeah, this is all part of that, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, now, on page four, under um, paragraph 12, what I'd like to do is, it, this talks about the warranties and says certain things that um, he has to do. And what I'd ask you to do is look at Exhibit C. So Exhibit C, it's page 17, is the redevelopment di gui deadlines. So he is uh, guaranteeing to try to, is to guaranteeing to hit these deadlines. If he doesn't hit these deadlines, there is a process that we'll talk about in a second, but these are the deadlines. By July 30th, 2020, to have a mutually agreeable purchase and sale agreement in place. We're going to be off a little bit by those days, but that's okay. I've spoken to his attorney about that. December 31st, 2020, the conveyance of the property has to be completed. Mm -hmm. December 31st, 2021, all invited, so it's one year. All environmental remediation required has to be done. Uh, the all necessary permits and approvals for the proposed development, redevelopment have to be secured, and all bank financing has to be put into place for redevelopment. Gives them a year to do that. Okay. Now, if at any point during that situation, or during that time frame, something gets in the way of that, such as what happened when for three months the state was shut down because of COVID, there is a force majeure provision that allows us to extend things reasonably. Okay. But it, it, there has to be, he has to stick by these. June 1st, 2022, construction has to begin by that date on the renovation. And by June 1st, 2023, a certificate of occupancy has to be provided. So it gives them a year to build. Um, time is of the essence in these things, which means in, in, in legal speak, that a deadline means a deadline. And at the time of the conveyance, they have to provide a $25,000 performance bond to the city that backs up these deadlines. So that if these deadlines are not met, the city gets the $25,000 performance bond. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I think to kind of circle back, those are the types of deadlines that I think Mr. Sewell was talking about that he probably hadn't seen in here. Mm -hmm. But those are normal types. And what I've done is I've modeled this after the, the types of purchase and sale agreements I would typically do for a redevelopment authority. Because what happens is all of these deadlines and all of the restrictions we talk about become covenants in the deed that we convey to him. And if he, mix and if he doesn't meet those deadlines after trying to meet them and we don't extend the date, then there is a reverter that comes back to the city. Now, that's the last thing the city wants, is a reverter back. But there is an enforcement mechanism in there. So if it did happen, we would get the property back plus $25,000. Um, and that's what's guaranteed under paragraph 12A. Um, under paragraph uh, 12C, it basically says that he has to redevelop it in the manner that he set forth in the development proposal which is attached as Exhibit A. And if you look at Exhibit A, which is, was his response, he basically says that he is planning on developing um, uh, 30 units, I believe, 30 market residential rental units. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's the purpose of the use of the property. Uh, my next comments will be on page 5. Page 5, uh, paragraph 15. If he defaults, in addition to um, the, the other things that are going on here, now, the development de guidelines happen after we convey. If he defaults before we convey, we keep uh, the deposit of $8,200, 8200 which is typical with what you'd see in a purchase and sale agreement as liquidated damages. Um, under paragraph 18, the proposal that he submitted, the development proposal and the price proposal and uh, the deadlines and the uh, right of entry is all going to end up in the deed. They're incorporated into this agreement. So we've made it so that the P&S 
matches the proposals, mm -hmm. the deed will match all of this as well, so that there'll be no confusion and survives the delivery of the deed. So that's important because normally when you get a deed to a piece of property, any conditions that were in the purchase and sale agreement are deemed satisfied or waived. These here, these, these will survive that. Again, it's for enforcement. Uh, you know, we enter into this in a, what we believe is a feeling of mutual trust, but from our perspective, it's trust with verification. Um, if they fail, on, on page six, if they fail to uh, uh, do the work or do something under the redevelopment guidelines, though that's that uh, exhibit C, um, we then have 30 days notice to them. Uh, if they don't do it within that point, it'll revert. There is a provision, uh, well, let me, I'll get to it in a second. Uh, they can't assign this purchase and sale agreement without permission from the city, okay? Um, sometimes they, they wanna, you wanna uh, convey it to another LLC that's wholly owned or something like that. That's typically allowed, but the purpose for this, and I have no reason to believe that this gentleman would do it, but as I said, when you've done these long enough, you know, burned once, you know, you're careful. Yeah. You want to make sure that somebody's not buying it as a straw for somebody else. And so any such transfer would have to be approved by the city. Um, not only that, but under paragraph 25, any transfer of the property within four years after conveyance to them has to be approved by the city. Again, that is so that the building doesn't get built and convey to somebody who we wouldn't have sold to in the first place, okay? And that's the best way to provide that, and that will work its way into the deed. Now, that doesn't prevent mortgages, and there's a specific provision with regarding mortgages that I'll discuss in a second. Um, under paragraph 27 on page eight, There is, a, in addition, there's a, there's, there are different cure provisions. They can request a 90-day extension on a cure provision and then a 60-day request after that. Now, that would be in the discretion of pretty much the building inspector at that point. Let's say something had happened and they didn't comply with the building code on something. They would be cited for it. He would be telling them, you have to get this fixed. You have to do something. They would have time to do it. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer if you have to undo and redo something that would provide some discretion um, to the, um, to the uh, building inspector. On page nine, this is the mortgagee's right to cure. So there's gonna be a substantial mortgage on this property in the long run. Unless you give a mortgagee, a mortgage company, a right to cure, you'll never get financing. So there has to be a right to cure in there. And what the right to cure is, if we say that Mr. Letterman did not do something he was supposed to do, did not meet a development guideline or something is happening after we convey it to him, then the mortgagee has the right to cure. What that means is they come in and they step in in his place. What they will either do is they'll find another developer who has to be acceptable to the city. They may finish it themselves depending on how far it is along and sell it, but they're subject to the same rules. But it's, because it's a bank, typically that does these things, there's a little bit of a longer guide uh, time frame. So the way it's, the term that comes up is lender investment development replacement. So if the bank comes up with a uh, developer replacement, they have nine months to do that. And they would be working with us. I mean, if it ever get down to this point, the city would be very, would be in very uh, substantial conversations with the bank that does this but there would be conversations with them, and if they can't transfer within nine months to somebody, they can request that in spite of their best efforts they couldn't do that, the city can give them another three months. Uh, the city doesn't have to, but they can, and if at the end of the whole process nothing has happened, unfortunately it reverts back to the city. <coughs> so what I've tried to do in here is create as many options as possible right. to get it to somebody else to finish so that we're not getting this property back, right. but that the project is still going on. Avoiding reversion. Pardon? Avoiding reversion. I'm reversion. trying, yeah. but that's the, the story at the end of the day. Um, on page 11 under paragraph 30, uh, they have the right to go into the building before we convey it to them to do studies, to do 
inspections to do whatever they need to. The LSP is going to have to go in there. Um, that's fine, but they have to uh, provide us with a general liability insurance policy listing us as an additional insured, uh, one million, two million, on that. If they're going to let anybody in the building, and that's to protect us. Now, under paragraph 32, the other thing that we we want to prevent against is that they build it and then suddenly convey it to a nonprofit. While nonprofits do wonderful things, no, no tax dollars. one thing they don't do is pay taxes. And so one of the reasons that the city would be willing to let this go f as cheap as they are is because there would need to be a substantial investment, the result of which would be a very positive impact on the commercial tax base. Right. Uh, and so uh, that's why we're willing to do that. We want to make sure we get that at the end. So if at any point in the 10 years after we convey it to them, they convey it to a nonprofit, there has to be a payment in lieu of taxes which is a dra a de a attached here, that has to be executed. Now, <clears throat> the payment in lieu of tax form that I've put in here that's attached is modeled after the one that Mayor Menino was looking at doing years ago in Boston. And I actually got it from the chairman of his commission a bunch of years ago, Steve Kidder, who was a, uh, a former commissioner of the Department of Revenue. <clears throat> and basically the way it is is you negotiate a price. There is an escalator every year, typically 2.5%. And you allow them to have a credit. They can get up to a 25% public service credit. Community service credit. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why typically when a hospital is tax exempt or when a social service agency is tax exempt, the justification for t exempting them from taxes is they're providing services to the community that wouldn't otherwise be provided that are for the benefit of the community. We want to recognize that but still say You've got to pay. And so typically what would happen is we would work the number out so that they were covering, out of every tax dollar, as you well know, a portion of it goes for public safety, a portion of it goes for maintenance of roads and community maintenance, okay? That's the portion, whatever, however many cents on the dollar that is, that's what we would try to recover from them in the payment of lieu of taxes. And that's how this is pretty much set up. So that would be under paragraph... 32. The nonprofit would have to consent to that. Yes, well, right in here, in the, uh, this is provision in the deed. They can't convey to the nonprofit unless the nonprofit consents to it. Mm -hmm. May, may I, on that point, because I was going to follow up with sure. a question, because um, it's similar to paragraph um, 14. The, um, <coughs> the reverter, if, if he sells within uh, four years. Well, flips it, yeah. Yeah. No, um, my, is that legal? Is that Yeah. It's a condition it uh, in restraining against alienation, if I recall. It's all right, but in redevelopment deeds, it's allowed, and this is treated like a redevelopment deed. So, when if the redevelopment authority is doing an urban renewal plan, and they're creating all these parcels, and they're setting it out, and the person has to do certain things, and it has to be used for a certain purpose, you can put in reasonably related, and the, for a public entity, we have a lot more leeway on this as long as it's reasonably related to the purpose that you're, you're, sell, you're selling it. Here, because of the reduced purchase price and the impact that we want it to have positively, we can do it. It just, it's not a restraint on alienation because it's really a conveyance with a condition subsequent. You got it. Subject to defeasance is what they really call it. So we hope we'll never get there, but we want to make sure that we have some teeth in this. And the one thing I can say is, I had substantial conversations with Attorney O'Neill about this and made sure that Attorney O'Neill had substantial conversations with Mr. Letterman about this. Yeah, because a lot of, I'm sorry to interrupt you, a lot of prior sales uh, with regard to the schools a number of years ago, um, that was, I, I, I know, I'm not an expert as you are in, in this. Well, I don't know uh, if I'm an expert stuff, or not, but uh, I have some experience. I say that a lot, so people probably wonder, what do you do? <laughs> Um, but uh, that the reverter issue was just a constant issue. I was I was told by one a, a, a council that uh, it was illegal. You can't do it. And now I'm here. You know. In some instances, it is. It depends on how you write it. The banks hate it. Is okay. It happened with the former police station. Yeah. It was flipped and then. Right. Was, uh, and that's you know that we don't want to get into that situation. So, for my two cents, I believe in being aggressive in these things. And if there's a problem, we deal with it. But let's be aggressive and try to get so that people know. Now, we would. 
the, you know, we would um, make it so that if there's a bank involved, you have to, typically a bank will require estoppel letters anyways. And if there are contractual rights that they have, that's when you start getting into a problem. Let's say it's a fully leased building, and suddenly we're trying to take it back from them. Well, first off, we would never want to do that. That's when the bank rights would come in to try to get the bank to do this instead of having us do this. But that is possible to do. Thank you. Um, there, there is a <coughs> contingency in here. And that contingency is that if Mr. Letterman can't ha uh, obtain a prospective purchaser letter by October 30th, 2020, then he has the right to walk away and get his deposit back. So that, that we, normally it takes about two months to get it. Um, if we're close to getting it and we need to extend it by a couple of weeks, we'll, I would advise that we do that. But um, that's a fair time frame, October 30th, for that to happen. Um, this paragraph 34 takes on more meaning these days than it has in the longest past, and that's force majeure. For years, people thought that force majeure was only about hurricanes, <laughs> lightning strikes, um, uh, acts of God. But now, pandemics right. are really deemed to be force majeure in some instances. And so this does have a provision in it regarding um, pandemics as well. Uh, something like what's happening right now with uh, what recently happened with the state of emergency where statutes of limitation and obligations were um, uh, put on hold. For example, somebody comes to you, they're selling chapter land. Normally there's 120 days for the municipality to say, yes or no, they're going to ex exercise their right of first refusal. Right now, that is on hold. That 120 days is not running um, until um, 120 days after the governor lifts his declaration of emergency. So that's an instance where a project would be put on hold unless you were able to negotiate something. So we wanted to make sure of that. Paragraph 35, um, we agree to reasonably support his applications for approvals um, at the Historical Commission and other boards, realizing that um, it's at no cost to us and that there is no conflict of interest and in realizing that these are all um, deliberative bodies. Um, so attached uh, is the Exhibit A is the uh, development proposal, Exhibit B is the price proposal, Exhibit C is the redevelopment uh, guidelines, Exhibit D is the payment in lieu of taxes. So the first thing that happens is they sign the agreement to do this. This has to be signed. Uh, we already um, have his signature on this. We would be countersigning this. And then the thing that is attached to it is really a draft mm -hmm. because that would be negotiated at the time of conveyance to a nonprofit if that happened so that we would have the numbers. So uh, thank you for your kindness in letting me go through this. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than willing to answer them. How's it feel? Just one, Attorney Thomas. I, I didn't hear the word demolition throughout your presentation. Um, is there, what, does, does the buyer have? He's intending on demolishing, uh, keeping the facade. Okay. The facade what if that intent isn't um, fulfilled? And he it's in the, it's right. in the development guidelines. He has to start construction. Let's say, for the sake of argument, he comes back and says to us, I'm not going to demolish it. Okay, I'm going to do something else. We would have to say yes to it. Because the proposal that he gave us is that it's going to be demolished. So he's going to have to go through all the permitting for that and for anything else. I assume that there's going to be some zoning permits, he's going to have, zoning relief he's going to have to go through. There's going to have to be some other relief. The property is located in a housing uh, in the HDIP, and so... I would tend to assume that he's going to apply for tax increment exemption on that as well. Um, but um, I did not put anything in here about demolishing or not because I'm more concerned than, to be frank with you, than the demolition in that the construction starts at a certain point and it's done at a certain point and it's in accordance with the guidelines, he, the proposal he made. So if he's going to do anything other than what he proposed, he has to come back to us. Okay, thank you. Awesome. A second. Okay. Uh, Mark Letterman. Yes. Come on up. <laughs> uh, Mary Sadi, anything from the administration on this? Uh, My son to come up. I know, Councillor. I believe um, Attorney Thomas did a good job putting together the um, purchase and sale agreement yeah. and Corporation Council together with Assistant Corporation Council. Um, 
Gary Howiak have um, reviewed the documents, and so we're all um, happy with the documents. And we are also happy that um, we're going to see development here in the city to at least um, improve upon that property that's been out there for a while and in tax foreclosure. Okay, Mr. Letterman, if you give us your name, your address, where you live. Sure. How many kids you got? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have three children. Name is Mark Lederman. Uh, my uh, business address, 29 Fremont Ave, Chelsea, Massachusetts. Uh, I live at that? 17 Bartlett Terrace in Newton. And the name of your business or corporation? The name of my business is uh, Weathersfield LLC. Okay. And, and the place of business is 29 Fremont I'm so Fremont sorry to interrupt. Is there a motion to waive the, waive the rules have for him? I don't think we have to, but well, I guess we can. No, yeah. don't have to. Okay. okay, thank you. I apologize. No, I apologize. Because it's committee. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Didn't mean to stop. Well, uh, any questions? Uh, well, well, basically, you know, uh, you, know you know about the building and everything else, and I think it's a big undertake. So that's for sure. Uh, you know, there probably be a little questions about uh, can you make the time frame that has been laid out for you? Uh, is is that? Something you can work with? It, 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 seems, it seems reasonable. Uh, there are many unknowns. I mean, we haven't, uh, we have an RFP, we have a plan to develop the property into the uh, 30 uh, residential units, but we are yet to uh, go through architectural and structural, mm -hmm. uh, let alone, uh, you know, environmental LSP. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, uh, our intention is to be able to keep the facade of the building but again, we have to work the facade into uh, physically fitting the units in, uh, such as uh, windows, egress, uh, and, and what have you. So uh, the plan is to follow exactly what we, uh, what we mentioned. We're in uh, unprecedented times. Uh, you know, can we get the plans in place? Can we get the structural? Can we get our permits in place? I mean, these are things that... I can certainly con can control my own schedule and my own actions, mm -hmm. but I don't know how fast the uh, building department c can act. I don't know how fast the zoning, uh, uh, you know, if I'm going to need zoning relief. Well, let, let, let me tell you, anybody who takes a project like you're taking, uh, you need cooperation from you, but you also need the cooperation of every department here in the city hall to make sure uh, that your investment is, is going to work out. I mean, you just don't come in and you're going to rehab that whole thing, cost you millions of dollars, and they're going to give you a hard time. I can almost guarantee you they're not going to give you a hard time. And I'm going to make sure, and I'm sure my colleagues will say the same thing in, in the mirror as well. I mean, we're not going to let you dry, take it, and then you're not going to get the permit or whatever the case may be. I'm going to be 100%, and I'm sure the administration will going to be 100% behind you. And I'm sure you're going to do things right. When, when you read your resume, you know, everything that you've done, the buildings and uh, some are inhabitable, and you turned around and you turned it around and you fixed it up, and you seem to have all the equipment you need in order to take the tanks out and uh, asbestos and everything else that goes with the job. Uh, i got to give you credit. I, I, I think uh, it's a big undertake. And uh, I'm glad you're on board. But you know what's happening in the city of Fall River, like you want to take this 30 units. We've done a lot of mills here in the city of Fall River. They have. Prime Care, they took a mill, a mill, a building, a mill, all offices. And then you got mills, it's all housing. We've got about three, four, maybe five now. And there's a few small ones, you got 30. There's 22 coming in for, I think, Anthony Cadero, and we put a 103 up on the waterfront in a six-story mill, and they're all getting like 12, 13, 1,400. I don't know where they get the money from, but they're renting them. So I think you're on the right track, uh, and, and you know what you got to do. Uh, Mr. Thomas has laid it out. <laughs> we didn't lay it out. <laughs> you had to... Some nights you never went to bed to put that project together, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Holy crap. You know, it, it took me two days to read the damn thing. But uh, do you feel comfortable uh, taking yes, this Yes, I, I do. I think the, uh, it seems that uh, you know, the, the city uh, and uh, my goals are aligned um, to develop uh, 
a piece of property and turn it into uh, a residential uh, uh, living space. That's what I do. I've done it for, for many, many years. Uh, on the uh, property management, I, I currently own and manage uh, a number of uh, uh, units, both that I own as well as I manage properties for, for, uh, for other customers. Uh, the development stage, uh, the development part of the project, that's what I do for a living. My hands don't uh, look like this because uh, I don't work for a living. I'm not afraid of hard work, but yeah. uh, uh, you know, there's an effort. It's, it doesn't come without a lot of effort. And uh, you know, this is a type of uh, opportunity that I've been looking uh, for for a long time. And uh, you know, it, it seems that, uh, uh, again, Oftentimes you're fighting, uh, you're fighting with the city, you're fighting with the neighbors. In this particular building, it seems our goals uh, are, are aligned and I think it's a good opportunity and I'd certainly like to try to make it happen. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, I was a little concerned they put a brand new sidewalk there. <laughs> I, w I was there the day they were pouring And it. I said, what are they doing? <laughs> what are they doing? If, if they're going to knock some of this down, you got a brand new sidewalk. I said, what are you guys doing? Oh, you know, it was yeah. part of the plan, well, so we put it in. Right. Well, again, our plan is really not to mess with the facade uh, too much. Yeah. Um, you know, we may have to put some staging or uh, drive some uh, aerial lifts, uh, you know, around the property. Mm -hmm. But again, the envelope of the property, we, uh, we plan on keeping. Now, we may have to put some holes for venting for yeah. uh, heating systems and air conditioning systems and who knows what with an elevator uh, in the building. But again, that's part of the uh, structural and architectural design, which, uh, you know, that's going to be one of, our, uh, one of our next steps. So if everything is a go and it goes through the council, uh, you got to get an architect. Is that what you need first? Well, again, it's, uh, you, we need to get an architectural plan. First step is really going to be uh, to get in there with, uh, with the LSP so we can make sure that uh, we really know, uh, you know the extent of, of what we have to do, how much digging and how much removal of soils and asbestos and lead and whatnot. Uh, we then have to get an architect uh, and uh, possibly a structural engineer in there to figure out what we can uh, demolish and what kind of space we actually have to have to work with. Yeah. You know, there's 30 units to lay out and you know, how are we going to lay it out? And I'm going to let the uh, hire the experts to uh, to let them tell me what we can physically put in there. We're going to work together and try to come up with something that's going to work. Uh, are you going to say save the jail cells? So, <laughs> that is a very good question because I've been up at night thinking. <laughs> I've been in no. <laughs> I've, I've been thinking, what do we do with the jail cells? Now, don't, we, de we were developing, this is last year, a property in Chelsea. We were actually installing a, uh, a utility line into an old bank building. And where are we putting in this water line? Into the old bank vault <laughs> with concrete walls, double concrete walls, 36 yeah, inches yeah. thick. <laughs> so the question is, what do we do with the uh, uh, with the old cells? And there's a number of them there, <laughs> I, and I'm not quite sure if the demo is going to be, or we might try to turn that into some storage areas yeah. that we can then uh, use for the uh, for the apartments. But again, this really has to do with the layout and, and design. With with 30 apartments, uh, how do you feel uh, uh, parking? How would you do the parking for them? Right, so that is definitely a concern and that is certainly some area that we're gonna need some kind of zoning relief because we certainly don't have uh, enough indoor parking to, uh, to deal with uh, that many units. But there are uh, existing the garage space that we're gonna be trying to convert that into uh, uh, some amount of uh, indoor parking. Uh, there is uh, parking on the street as well as there are some available parking lots that I'm hoping to be able to uh, have some conversations uh, with making those spots available for rent uh, to my uh, future tenants. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the guys that was looking at it considered putting on the first floor parking and the guy wanted to put, I think, uh, 67 units. He was going to do parking on the second floor. But he didn't bid on it, so I Yeah, I, 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 I mean, it, <laughs> my biggest concern with fitting the units in there, again, is, is having the proper amount of window space. Yeah. Um, you know, every bedroom needs uh, egress windows, and, you know, h how do you orient the, uh, the units so that we can have, uh, you know, proper uh, ventilation and lighting 
And again, that's going to be an architectural uh, challenge that we're going to have to deal with. Well, um, uh, you know, I, I certainly on board. I give you credit. You got a lot of the guts to say you're going to take this on. Well, I'm glad you that know. you're giving me the credit. Now we have to make sure that the bank is going to give me credit. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I can't help you there. I want to fix income. Um, the council killed me. Yeah, just, just one point, historical point um, that's interesting. Um, when back in another career, I was a teacher, and um, we brought the kids on a field trip when the, when the place was still still functional, and uh, Sergeant Gregory uh, brought us down into the uh, the basement of area, you know, where the jail cells are and stuff like that. And he pulled out a very old book that when they literally booked people, right? You know, and Lizzie Borden. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. So. I'm sure it's at the Historical Society, oh, no, so sure. that's, I mean, she's a famous, <laughs> uh, famous lady. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, no, seriously, I, I really wish you well with this. I mean, I, you'll probably get the key to the city and a citation from us. And, you know, keep if, your citations. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm sure you're thinking about what you're going to name it. And, and uh, but it, it is an actually, actually, it's it's a nice place to, a nice area to live. Mm -hmm. The improvements uh, that were made, yeah, the, the new restaurants that are opening, everything's in walking distance, the post office, city hall, like I say, restaurants. Which I'm actually like hoping that. to offset some of the parking necessities. Nowadays, who knows, everyone has yeah. two and three cars. However, uh, being so close to uh, the, wharf, know, the, the, the wharf the and the parades that occur areas. up and down the Christmas parades and things. I think it'll be very remarkable. I hope so. Yeah, so good luck. I'm, Thank you. I'm, I'm, How you doing? Sorry. Sorry. Um, so I, I just had, I'm sorry, not before. <laughs> you yield, Council? I, I yield, yes. Council Lee. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, as, far as, as far as the parking goes, that was also another concern, and I'm not going to make any suggestions to you at all. I, I'll, I'll leave that I, to I'm you. I'm actually open to suggestions. <laughs> with, uh, is, that, is, is, under, is underground parking a possibility? Not really. Okay. Um, the, the only real basement space that I've seen in the building, it's actually not with a jail. So that's the garage the in the back with the service cars? Um, well... The underground space is is the big where the boiler is uh, mm -hmm. in, in the in the front of the uh, building. That's where we have some of the asbestos where the old uh, tank was. Um, the Not first doable. floor actually starts to go underground because it, it comes up on the hill. Um, so our windows start to actually get to be uh, you know closer to ground level. So even that what amounts to the first floor, there's still a few feet that are underground. Do you have a lot of familiarity with Fall River in general? Um, we, oh, in the past, we did some work, uh, and we did have a couple of big jobs that we did for the city a number of years ago, down at the wharf and uh, something with some tree pits years ago. But uh, I don't know, I, you know, so we worked in the city before, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, I'm not too familiar. We, with we've had some significant, significant issues with some properties, people trying to invest in properties. Um, I don't know any other word to use it. Shenanigans have come down the line. Um, for whatever reason, there's people out there that always try to get involved in uh, blocking <laughs> progress. Okay. And I guess, I guess in some cases, some of our uh, potential investors, have their, their resolve have been tested um, no, on numerous occasions. And I just, I'm just, you know, you don't have that... Um, you know that tie to the city yet? You don't have that, you know, that investment, that emotional investment into the city. So, I ask you, how how far are you willing to go if challenges come? Well, what, what kind of challenges? Are <clears throat> I, 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 without going into too much detail, we've had, I mean, we've had, you know, EPA P, uh, police coming down the line to uh, to investigate on an investor for um, environmental police, um, you know, things, and sometimes that sometimes I. It looks like it's a frivolous activity, and it's it's frustrated some yeah. investors. So, um, look, uh, I don't know who um, whose toes I'm going to step on yeah. by trying to develop the property, um, but if I'm just looking at it face value, no one else bid on the property. Now, I didn't know that for years too. By the right? way, yeah. Hmm. So it's not if I'm going up against somebody disgruntled. You know, yeah. Now, listen, if I cut somebody off going down Third Street or whatever, <laughs> I, listen, I can't, you know, I can only do what yeah. I can do. Um, you know, I try to do things correctly in, yep. in, 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 in on the up and up, and we have some environmental issues. It's a high profile site. I mean, I'm not going to be taking asbestos and trying to dump it in the river. It's yeah. not, I mean, it's, yeah. First of all, it's not that expensive to get rid of asbestos. The other issues, yes, but 
you know, we're going to have an LSP as an oversight for the environmental, yep. and we're going to handle it appropriately and take care of it uh, uh, properly. It's really no option right. for me to do it. I mean, it's known asbestos. Everybody knows what asbestos looks like. Mm -hmm. Not there's enough of it there that it's going to have to go someplace. And this isn't. <laughs> this is very different. Uh, this property would be very different from some of the mills that we've dealt with right. because obviously it's a grander scale on the mills. But I just use that as an example. Right. Sometimes well, the challenges come down the line, and it's it's Listen, tough. I, you know, I, I, I've been through the processes of uh, you know permitting and zoning and, and, and what have you, and. Uh, uh, you know, as you mentioned before, it's important to have the city council or, uh, on the well, same page. Uh, in you know, my development proposal, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of modeled after what was requested. Mm -hmm. You know, to have uh, you know a middle income residential uh, development, and that's really in line with what I do and what I want to do. Yep. So you know, I'm. Uh, I, at least uh, uh, starting out, I don't think I'm butting heads with anybody. I want to develop what you want. I just have to make sure that I can actually get it done. Yeah. And I'm going to need, you know, the zoning relief, and I'm going to need the uh, you know, historic relief possibly, Course, and right. what have you. We'll just have to go through the process, and, you know, it has to start at, uh, at, at step one, and, you know, I think we're almost there. And, and, the, um, and please correct me where I'm wrong on this. The 25% for um, community-based... Um, contribution, would you call it? Well, what was that again? I'm that sorry. wouldn't apply to him unless he went to a non profit. To a non okay, okay, all right. Unless Thank the you. property was transferred. I hope to be a profit. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all are hoping for that, by the way. Um, thank, you, thank you for that, and, and I appreciate uh, the time. So, and, and, you. and, you know, just to add to that, to try to make you more comfortable, what I have done, uh, you know, in my uh, career, my building development career, is I buy, I fix, and I rent. And I hold. It's really not my model to buy and flip. It's it's not really. We've had one property, you know, in my life that we bought, we developed, and we flipped it. And it wasn't really my choice. It was my partner's choice to, uh, to flip and get rid of it. It was a single family, and those aren't the best uh, long-term investments. You've been doing this for nine years. Nine, uh, I've been doing it for longer than nine. I've been doing it under Weathersfield well, LLC for nine, but I also own and manage other corporations. Um, and we, I've been in business since 1995. Okay. Um, I you know, bought my first house uh, about 30 years ago, and I still own it, uh, and I still manage it. And uh, you know, that was when I was uh, a youngster up on the roof. And uh, you know, I hope uh, <laughs> I'll be as hands-on as I have to be. This is obviously a much more substantial yeah. building, mm -hmm. but um, I do have the capability to get it done, to get the right people in there to, to help me get it done. Okay. Yield. I yield. Thank you. All right. Just in closing. I, uh, you know, you seem to be a very nice guy and <coughs> got a good track record and everything else. And we had bad people in Fall River. Politicians are not bad. We'll try to help you out as much as you can. I don't think you're going to get too much static, to be honest with you, uh, because you're taking a building that's been empty for 23 years and headaches. I've been on for 33 years. It's been a headache for at least 23 years. So I see myself... <laughs> Well, maybe we can get rid of this thing, and uh, and maybe you can help the city out as well. Uh, I think your intentions are very well put together, and I think the, the, the sales and purchase agreement it seems to be all right with you and your lawyer. So uh, that's the thing that we're going in the right direction, I feel. Uh, Council Kill. Yes, I'm going to make a motion, but before I do, I want to, uh, again, wish you luck. First impression, you seem very humble. You seem very hardworking. You seem like a Genuine. very honest guy. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, you, your son here. So, you know, someday he takes over the business, so it'll be a good learning experience for him. Right. Hang on one second. Um, excuse me? Hang on one second for the motion. Okay. Uh, anything to say? Add? Um, n no, Counselor. Um, just that, you know, we are, as, as an administration, happy to have you on board, um, and we will do everything we can in terms of working with each of the department heads if you have any problems, you can reach out to myself, and we will um, expedite the meetings with the department heads um, so that um, you don't have any bumps in the road going forward. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, you said a lot, but do you want to add anything? Do it. Oh, I'm done. Thank, Thank you. God. <laughs> Council <laughs> Kilby. One other thing. I'm sorry if I'm over-talking here, but just what Mary said, I mean, she probably should be your go-to person. Uh, 
Um, you know, we have a new administration. I don't know if you've been paying attention in the papers what happened uh, went on here a number of years ago. <coughs> so I think there's a whole different atmosphere in terms of honesty and integrity moving forward. Okay. So with that, uh, I'll make a motion that we award uh, an ex or accept this proposal and uh, move it to full council. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We also. Okay, thank you very much. Good and thank you. Keep very good, thank you. Thank you very and, much. Uh, catch you after. Uh, motion, motion to adjourn. To adjourn. So from a procedural Second. point of Second. view. Second. All in favor? Council Aye. Now. Okay. Um, and then they will vote.